let me, uh, let me start. So, uh, last time I uh, came around to refining algebraic geometry codes where there were two complementary constructions. One of them was obtained by evaluating functions. Uh, so, then I should also evaluate them. So, it was obtained by evaluating functions in rational places like this, and the functions are chosen from a suitable L space like this, and there was another construction using differentials, where you take residues of differentials in rational places, and now the, rest, the, the differentials are from a certain space of differentials, namely omega was it g minus d, like this. Okay, and it turned out that uh, these codes, they have computable <coughs> dimensions, and there is a bound on the minimum distance of these codes, namely, in this case, we get n minus the degree, so where n stands for the number of rational places I have chosen, and in this case, we get another lower bound, namely the degree of the divisor minus 2g plus 2, where g is the genus of the function field I have used. And uh, I should not say equal, but also here the bound of. Now, if we look at these, these two bounds, then uh, in general they are quite good. But it is clear that if the degree of the divisor is small, say less than 2g minus 2, then this is going to be negative. Yeah, so it's still a true statement, but a rather empty one. And similarly, if the degree of this divisor is larger than n, also here we get a completely trivial statement. So there is something, something disturbing about these results in general. So uh, what I want to do today is give you a slightly better bound that indeed will be better, especially for low and high degree divisors. But uh, before I do that, I also want to talk about uh, an example and about the decoding problem. Okay, so let us first look at an example. So the example taken all along the one where things are simplest, simply take the rational function field. And uh, in that case, we know all the rational places. There are q plus 1 of them. So we have q rational places namely corresponding to uh, polynomials x minus alpha, where alpha is an element of fq. So there we have q of them, and then there is one myth more, namely this place at infinity, p infinite. So we could, in principle, using this construction, construct codes of length q plus 1. Now in the example, I'm not going to use this one in the divisor, capital D, so in fact I will just only use these. So what does it mean? So I pick my d to be p1 plus pq, and the divisor g is going to be a multiple of this p infinity. And then, in a previous uh, lecture, I mentioned that this L space can be computed explicitly. Well, in fact, for any divisor, this L space can be computed explicitly in case of the rational function field without any uh, problems. So, so let me just now get on this track. Let me say that in general, if I pick a function field, computation of this L space is possible algorithmically, but it's not always easy to get an explicit answer. Now certainly in the, these families of curves, in these families of codes I mentioned last time, it is not at all obvious how these L spaces behave, even if I pick the divisor very simple all the time. But in this case, there's no problem, because
because what happens is that I get polynomials of degree at most m. Okay, so, so in that case I know exactly what is going on. So this means that if I, I look at this example, so then the code word is going to look like evaluation of these. Well, let me just write it like that. I really just take a polynomial and I evaluate it in all elements of the finite field. Yeah, that's exactly what is going to happen. So I get a length Q code word and I just evaluate polynomials in all elements of the finite field. And that's all that's going to happen. And this is a well-known uh, code. This is uh, an example of a so-called Reed-Solomon code. So they came up uh, with this uh, construction in a slightly different way uh, before Coppa had this generalization. And this may have been a source of inspiration. So, so this Reed-Solomon code is, is uh, the great success story of applied algebra, because these are used in practice a lot. Yeah, so any DVD player uses these codes. So, uh, in this case, we can even make a nice picture, because what, what we have, if we have such a code word from this particular Reed Solomon code, what's really going on is that if we here, on the axis here, put all the elements of the finite field, just pretending that we could do that as if it were the real numbers, if we put them on an axis like this, then what is a code word? Well, they are evaluations of some polynomial of these values. So we get some points like this, some kind of polynomial graph. You can think of a code word in this way, but it's rather the second coordinate of these uh, points that come in the code word itself. So uh, then, then now what is it we want to do with such codes? So what we really want to do is solve the so-called decoding problem. So what happens is that, let us suppose that we have a code word C here, from any code in fact, and it is sent over in some way to a, a receiving end. Yeah, so we have a, a receiver here, and we have a sender here. And now what happens is that on the, on the way from the sender to the receiver there's some problem and some of the coordinates of this code word get changed. So what we get here is no longer a code word in general but just some element from FQ to the N. Because this code was inside here. So then what we want to figure out is what, what is the most likely code word that the sender tries to communicate. So what we need to figure out is so given this R what we need to find is a code word yeah, and so, so we have to imagine that it should not be very likely that coordinates of the code word gets changed, but there is some probability that this will happen. And then the most likely code word is the one that is closest to it, in the sense that most coordinates should be the same, but a few different. So what we want to find is the closest code word. closest in this Hamming metric that I mentioned. So it just means practical algorithm, well, a, a, a possible algorithm would be we just compare R to all possible code words, we compute the Hamming distance and then we pick one of smallest distance. But this is going to take a long time. So this is a possible way, but not 
a feasible way. So this is the, the most general problem. Now this is a very difficult problem. Yeah, for a particular code of moderate size, and I mentioned this may be doable, but uh, it is known that for general linear codes, this is an, uh, a very difficult and hard problem. So usually we uh, add an assumption to make it more feasible. So usually we assume that there exists a code word such that the heading distance from the code word to R is uh, uh, equal to t, where 2t is less than the minimum distance of the code. Yeah, so what this means in the picture is that we have some received vector r, we are assuming that there is a code word c, with Hamming distance yeah, equal to t, we said here. And uh, if 2t is strictly less than the minimum distance of a code, it means that if I pick any other code word here, then this distance will have to be strictly larger than t, because the distance between these two, according to the definition of a minimum distance of a code, is at least d. Yeah, so this will have to hold uh, using the triangle inequality for the Hamming metric. Yeah, so it means that this assumption essentially means that this C is unique, making the problem a lot simpler. Okay, so, so with that additional assumption, we would like now to, to do this, to try to find a decoding scheme, the decoding algorithm, at least for these, uh, these, these codes coming from algebraic geometry. So what it really means, if we, uh, we look at this picture again, so what happens is that, uh, so we have this, this collection of points, so let us, just for the sake of argument, suppose this is a parabola, and now there are a few points changed. So what we get at the receiving end is just a collection of points. We don't know anymore what the curve was passing through them, what polynomial was used, and we somehow have to do yeah, some kind of fitting. We have to find the, the, the polynomial that passes through most of the points. And once we have found that, we can then figure out where the errors are and correct them. But uh, this is uh, it's not such an easy task. And in fact, in the original article, when this, these codes, these Reed Solomon codes, were introduced for the first time, they suggested just to pick, well, let's say we have uh, uh, polynomials of degree m. So if we have m plus 1 points, the, the, this polynomial is uniquely determined. So just pick all possible subsets of m plus 1 points, compute the corresponding polynomial, and the one that occurs most is the right one. It's again not a very fast algorithm, though it does solve the problem. What we're going to do is another idea which uh, makes it much faster. So here's what we will do. The idea is what we try to find is a polynomial in Y of a very specific form, namely we have Q1 times Y plus Q0. What are Q1 and Q0? They are coefficients lying in certain L spaces. Okay, so we already have the divisor G in the definition of the code we are using. So we're trying to decode this code CLDG here. And uh, we assume that there are on the way a uh, number of errors, at most T. And this T has to satisfy this at least, but let us see. So we have a divisor of this degree, 
and it doesn't matter which one for now, we just pick anything. Yeah, so what is the picture? We have a C which is of this form. <coughs> we have an R in FQ to the N, and I'm assuming now that the Hamming distance between C and R <coughs> is less than or equal to T. Okay, so, so far so good, but what is the real idea with this algorithm? The real idea is that we are trying to interpolate through the received points. We don't know the sent points, but we do know the received points. So let me get, let me write that down explicitly. So what we are trying to do is somehow reformulate this into an interpolation problem. So the basic property is that for any i, what we want is that q1 evaluated in pi times ri, the ith coordinate of the received word here, plus q0 times pi has to be 0. Okay, so it turns out that what I really want is that I can evaluate in this pi, so I had better put the restriction on the divisor that uh, the, the, the rational places do not occur in it. Yeah, so that is a restriction on the divisor. A uh, way to say this is that the support of A intersected with the support of D is going to be empty. The same restriction that we also put on the G, in fact. Yeah, so this is now the idea. So now we reinterpolate through the received points. Well, there could be many possible solutions, of course, but now what turns out to happen is that under a certain assumption that I will explain later, that this interpolated curve will be this one. If we, we, we plot a zero set, what happens is exactly this. I'll show that later. So, the zero set of a solution to this, if I have done everything correct, will contain the polynomial or the function in general that I'm looking for plus some vertical lines. But let us see how that comes about. So, the lemma is If Q of Y exists and it is not allowed to be the zero polynomial, that of course will always solve this, but it should be a non-zero solution. If this holds, then Y minus F divides Q of Y. Yeah, and this F is the one that was used to create the code word. So it means if this is true, then if we have such an interpolation polynomial of this very specific form, then we can recover the function that was used to create the code word. And if we can do that, we can recreate the code word itself. Yeah, so, so this is really uh, the key to what's going on. So apparently, you can factor this Q of Y into Y minus F times Q1. And this is how this picture arises. The Y minus F gives you this graph, and the Q1 will give you these vertical lines. Now let us prove this. This is an essential ingredient. So what we are going to do Consider the function q of f. Yeah, this will be an element from the function field. So in place of y, I just substitute this function f. And what I want to show is that this is the zero element. So um, what can we just say about this function? Well, this is exactly why this q1 and q2 and q0 were chosen from these uh, L spaces, because what happens here is this Q1 times F will also be in this L space. But this is simply an element 
of this L space. That is the reason for the minus g there. Okay, but what can we say about this? Well, um, so, so, if at some coordinates i there is no error, yeah, so this, there are a few errors, but there are also supposed to be positions where r and c are identical. Yeah, so, so let's say we have one here. Well, that will imply that qf, this is an element of the function field, so I can evaluate it in pi, and this is going to be zero. And why is that? Well, qf evaluated in pi is this expression here, but with RRR replaced by FPI. That's exactly what it is. If I write this out, I get this expression, but here there will be an F of PI. Yeah, but if they're equal, okay, they're zero by construction. By the way, we have chosen our polynomial. So you see here that we get again, like we had before, additional information about the function. It vanishes in certain places. So in fact, This Q of F is then an element of L A minus yeah, all the positions where there are no errors. Well, we know exactly how many errors there are, uh, or at least we have an upper bound and that's enough. So we know that this condition here will be satisfied for at least N minus T positions. Yeah, so there are n minus t coordinates where this holds. This gives you this extra information about the function. Okay, and now all of a sudden this condition here starts to make sense. So the divisor had degree less than n minus t, meaning that the degree of this divisor is negative. So it has to be the zero function. So, so in the proof you see why this is a natural thing to do and this as well. Okay, so uh, indeed this is the zero function, and uh, that is what we need. Now, I have not really done anything yet, because I just assumed that this qy exists. And that's not clear at all yet. However, if we look at what we have done here, yeah, so we have some freedom on how to choose q1 and q0. On the other hand, here we get restrictions. We get restrictions that this QY has to satisfy. So now we get kind of an interplay. Yeah, so analyzing this carefully, you can see, well, this has a certain dimension, this has a certain dimension. Here we get the number of restrictions. So as long as the sum of the dimensions of these two spaces is, is uh, strictly larger than the number of equations we have, we will find a non-zero solution because it's simply we can reformulate all this in a linear algebra problem by simply choosing basis for these two spaces. Then it becomes linear algebra to find solutions. So it is clear that if this degree of A is too small, then these dimensions, the sum of these dimensions will be too small. Yeah, then, then these conditions will be, uh, it will be uh, they, they will just force the polynomial to be zero. On the other hand, if the degree of A is very large, it means that the number of errors that we can correct is not going to be very big. So it's an interplay and it gives you uh, a, a bound on the number of errors that one can correct. Now, if you just do this dimension count, and I, I advise you to do that, we'll end up with a result that uh, actually can be improved a little bit. But uh, let me state you the result. So it is not a lemma.
So if you do the analysis very carefully, this you have to refine this dimension argument a little bit, then what you can show is that this QY exists if this inequality holds. Now, it is, as expected, you cannot correct as many errors as you want. There will be some bound on it. Now, this 2T, yeah, remember that's what we want to compare that to in this problem of decoding was uh, D. Yeah, if, as long as 2T is less than D, we, we, we expect this, kind of expect this to work. Because then at least we know that the unique C exists. But now if we look at the actual formula, yeah, so this, this was a bound, this was an upper bound for this DL. Uh, sorry, a lower bound. That we had, uh, that we had before. So there is this annoying minus g here. Yeah, so it is an effect of life that this algorithm cannot live up to this problem, this decoding problem. There is a penalty apparently in using curves of g that's larger than zero, and you see it here. And uh, if you would have done the analysis just using the linear algebra, you would actually get the 2g here. But at least you can get rid of the 2. Yeah, so apparently there is something, uh, something more complicated going on. But uh, let me also tell you that this cannot be uh, improved in general. Yeah, there are simply examples where you can show that the number of errors you want to correct is still uh, uh, less than this DL, uh, half of this DL. Nonetheless, the non-zero QI does not exist, so that may happen. You cannot improve this in general. On the other hand, we can say that uh, this genus will, will in general be, yeah, it, it is a price to pay, but in, in some particular cases it is not too bad. This algorithm in itself is already quite good, quite interesting. Okay, let me see how I'm doing with time. And I'm also a bit confused about where the mobile phone now is. Okay. So, uh, so I have half an hour left. Good. Let me just say a little bit about uh, what this has for practical implications. So the point is that uh, for these read solomon codes, if you reformulate this algorithm several times and use some uh, computational Trickery, you can get this to, yeah, let me just, there are some logarithmic factors here that I'm not quite sure of, let, let me just say this, this is definitely correct. It's probably log n squared times the log log n. But anyway, it's essentially linear in the length of the code. And this, this is uh, an algorithm with this complexity is also used in these practical applications, like the DVD. Now if we compare this, with what is known for the Hermitian codes, so similar codes arising from the Hermitian function field, then for the longest time, the best that was known was 7 thirds, maybe with some logarithmic factors there as well, which was by a Japanese engineer mathematician, Sakata. And uh, this has been the state of the art for a long time. It has been improved slightly with, again, some, some logarithmic factors, I will abbreviate like this, to n squared. So, um, you can improve it to this, this is now known, but still for practical implications this is not good enough. You would also need uh, an algorithm essentially linear in n, but at least there have, has been some, to, some progress recently. This was done by uh, one of my students and myself. But there's still hope that we may reach this linear complexity and then all of a sudden they would become relevant for, for applications as well. Okay. So that was uh, one thing I wanted to tell you, there are several uh, generalizations of this type of decoding 
So uh, one way is to, to allow higher powers of this variable y as well, which will sometimes allow you to correct more errors even. But uh, I don't want to go into the details here. That is one way to get rid of this minus the, g the genus. But there are other ways. And uh, all process plans, I will explain one tomorrow. What I want to do now is uh, look again at this lower bound for the minimum distance. So as I already told you, that we are in this annoying situation that, for example, this d omega it was larger than or equal to the degree of the genus uh, of the divisor minus 2g plus 2. And if the, the degree is very small, this is a negative number in general. So we would like to get a better result than this. So I'm going to focus on this one. I could also do the, the same for the, the DL, the minimum distance of evaluation codes, but it's essentially the same thing. The only thing I'm going to assume from now on is that this G is not any divisor. For simplicity, I will assume that it is a multiple of a rational place. It's not strictly necessary, but it does ease the notation a lot. So what I'm going to do is recover this result in a different way, but it will also sometimes improve this result. Not just in the case where this happens to be negative, but also uh, in some non-trivial cases. And the way to do that is to use a little bit more information. So this bound only uses the genus. So what I'm going to use is the so-called Weierstrass semigroup. Okay, so to define that one, let me first define a ring. This is going to be the union of all L spaces of the form multiple of P. Yeah, so, so if I, I look at those kind of uh, L spaces, then these are functions that are regular everywhere that may have a pole in this one place P. And if I take the union of all those, then I'm guaranteed to get a ring because if I multiply two elements, the only thing that may happen is that the pole order P gets lower, uh, gets higher, but that's okay, it's again in this uh, union. So this is a ring. And then the virus plus semigroup, H of T, is going to be minus the valuation of all elements in this ring. And let me throw out the zero element. So if we look at what this is in the simplest case again, if we take the rational function field, yeah, we have already seen that if we pick P to be this place at infinity, so to say, then this L of IP consists of polynomials of the green at most I. So if I take the union of all these, what happens is I just get the polynomial ring. And then the Weierstrass semigroup is going to be yeah, all possible degrees of polynomials. So it's simply going to be all non-negative integers. So here we get as a semigroup all possible non-negative integers. So if we look at another example that we have seen before, if we look at the Hermitian function field, so what happens here is, uh, and, and we choose for P again this place at infinity that I have defined. If we do this, then it turns out that this ring. I already have, have shown you before that these L spaces in this case can be generated by monomials, or at least I have shown that this is a subspace, but in fact it can be generated. So this ring will be all polynomial expressions in these two variables subject to this equation. 
So it is a, if you want a bivariate polynomial ring, modulo of an ideal. So let's, let's look at it like this. And what happens in this case with the y squared semigroup is the following. So let us look at some elements in this. So we certainly have the constant function 1 in here. And if we take minus the valuation of that, we get the number 0. So this 0 just comes from looking at the function 1 which is in here. Now then if we look at the, the minus the valuation of the coordinate functions x1 and x2, well for x1 the valuation was minus q, but we have the minus in the definition there, so we get the q from the coordinate function x1, and we get the q plus 1 from the coordinate function x2. And it turns out that if you have those two, you can describe the whole, whole Weierstrass semigroup. Because then, how can we get more elements from here? Well, let's look at the valuation with the minus of x1 squared. That is going to give you 2q. And if I take the product of these two functions, x1 times x2, then I get q plus q plus 1, which is 2q plus 1 and so forth and so on. If I take x2 squared, let me do one more, I get 2q plus 2, and it continues like that. Yeah, so the reason it is called a Weierstrass semigroup is that we have this property. If we have two elements from here, we add them, that will again be an element of this set. So it is a semigroup in that sense. Yeah, so maybe I should have written this down here. This is the Weierstrass of P. <coughs> now what we saw in the second case is that uh, this Weierstrass semigroup doesn't have to be the whole of n. Yeah, so if we choose q larger than 1, here we do not get all the non-negative integers. And in fact, that's the way it should be, because there's the so-called Weierstrass gap theorem, which tells you exactly how many elements you are missing. So what does it say? It simply says that if we look at the number of elements from n that are not in the semigroup, then the cardinality is exactly the genus. Yeah, so we saw in the rational function field, this was just n, which fits with the fact that the genus of the rational function field is zero. So apparently, if we look at this one, then the number of elements we don't have, the number of gaps, as they are called, should be one half q times q minus one. So I'll leave that to you to check that, if this is really the case. So here we see that if we are using a Weierstrass semigroup of a rational place, then we are indeed using more than just the genus. The genus is encoded in this semigroup in this way. Okay, and, and the proof of this theorem is, is again a consequence of riemann roch theorem. Okay, so now to see how we can improve the bounds on the minimum distance that we had before. We at least start with that today. So, what we are going to use is a little bit of notation to make this work. So I'm going to choose functions f. So, so this means that, so this is going to happen for all elements in the seven. Okay, this is just to, to keep track of uh, essentially the semigroup operation here. We will see that later. So we have these functions and then I'm going to define a matrix. So, define a matrix, we have H of P, 
which is now, let me give these entries names, ordered. So we have row 1, which will have to be the 0, and, and actually, and then after that we get the other elements of the right, the semi group. And now we make a matrix, say M, in the following way. What I do is I, as a row in this matrix, I take the code words belonging to these functions. Yeah, and in principle, one could go on here indefinitely, but I'm going to stop at some point here. So say with a row M. And uh, what we want is that the rank of this matrix M is going to be maximal, namely N. Yeah, so this is an N times capital N, uh, well, capital N times small n matrix, and we assume it has full rank. Now, what, why, why can we actually do that? So what I'm saying is that if I keep adding rows here, that eventually the rank will become maximal, small n. But that is actually a consequence of the formula we had for uh, the dimension of these evaluation codes. Yeah, so as the degree of this divisor we use increases, the dimension will eventually be n. So, in other words, all these evaluation codes were the subspace of fq to the n, but at some point it's going to be the entire space. That is what this statement is. So, if we have this, So what are we going to do now? We are going to use a very clever idea, originally uh, found by Feng and Rao, two engineers who looked at this coding problem. So what we are going to do is we look at a very specific matrix, namely Sorry, let me just say an FQ to the N. Yeah, given any word in there, we define the following matrix. So it's M, then we put a diagonal matrix here, where the diagonal elements are simply the coordinates of the word I've chosen there. And then I multiply this with the transpose. Yeah, so this was an, uh, an N times, capital N times small n matrix. So this product makes sense. And uh, since this M has maximal rank small n, the say, well, we can say something about the rank of this matrix. Yeah, so these two matrices, they have both rank n. So what can we say about the rank of this matrix here? Well, it is just that the rank of this one is going to be the same as the rank of the middle one. Okay, and what is that? Well, that is simply the number of non-zero elements on the diagonal. So this is nothing else but the Hamming weight of the C we have chosen there. That's exactly what it is. So again, this Hamming weight comes in in a nice way. Yeah, so, th so this equality, because this Hamming weight counted the number of non-zero coordinates. That's exactly the rank of this matrix. Okay, so if we can say anything sensible about the rank of this matrix, if we choose for C a certain code word, then we are doing a good job. So what we want is somehow to say something about the rank of this matrix.
So this is the whole key idea. Investigate the rank of this matrix. Yeah, in general, we cannot say anything about it, but now we have to choose for our C a very specific one from a, from a code we want to look at. Okay, so what I will do is I'm going to choose it from the dual of such an evaluation code. Yeah, and, and recall that this was actually just this omega construction. So I'm going to say something about this omega codes now. But as I told you before, these two, this omega and this L construction are essentially the same. So I can also get a statement about evaluation codes. But let's, let's stick to this for now. And I will also assume that C is not an element of this code. So what I, I'm essentially saying is that, well, I have one code here. This is this CL DMP. This is a slightly smaller code in general. And my code work has to come from here. This is where it is from. And uh, well, under this assumption, it turns out that you can say quite a bit about this matrix S of C. So, what you can do is calculate some of its entries. Not all of them, but you can calculate some of its entries. So let us try to do that. matrix M that I defined. Yeah, then since I have a product of three matrices, I, I might fear I get a, a double summation, but this is a diagonal matrix, so that makes it a little bit easier. So what we get here is C of K, and then I have to look at the KJ element of the transpose. That is what it is. Now, and if I use now what M is, I define M to be of this form, then I get the following expression. So it's a summation over K. I get F of rho I evaluated in PK. That is the IK entry of M. I multiply with C of K. Yeah, but what was C of k again? C of k is an element from this residue code. So this is going to be residue at p of k of some differential omega. And I have to multiply now with this one, rho of j pk. Yeah, so this is when I use all the information I, I have in the definition of m. And from the choice of this code word C, this is what it is. And uh, this, this omega is over a specific space. So I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay, and just as we had in this proof of duality, you can see that you can just absorb all this in one go, like this. And we get this result. Now, we have to investigate where this is, where this lives. So, what do we know about this? Well, this has, is a regular function except at this specified place, P. Yeah, so where is this from? Okay, so 
so first of all, this omega, it was from m p minus d. And then this product just puts an, an additional pole possibly in p. So we get this result. This is where this differential is from. Yeah, so collecting everything together, what we get is m minus rho i minus rho j times p minus d. Okay, so it looks complicated, but it isn't. I just use the definition and the choice of the code word. And then we see we get the sum of residues, and this residue or the differential involved there is from here. So what we see is that this S of C I K is zero if rho i plus rho j is less than or equal to m, because in that case the only poles that this divisor can have are along d. So I'm actually taking the sum of all residues, so I have the residue theorem working for me again. But I also can say that it is uh, non-zero if we have that this is equal to m plus 1, because then for sure I am missing one residue, namely at p. And then the pole order at p will be exactly 1, so apparently I'm missing one residue, so then using the residue theorem, this sum is equal to minus the residue at p. So it's non-zero. That's what I mean with the star. Yeah, and if, if rho i plus rho j is, is larger than m plus 1, I have no idea. Maybe 0, maybe not. That's unclear. Okay, so I get some partial information on this matrix. Okay, so let me let me tell you what this implies, what this means. Because this partial information is enough to say something about the rank. Okay, so let us define n of m plus 1 to be the number of pairs rho i rho j from the semigroup times itself such that the sum of these two is equal to m plus 1. Let us define it like this. So then what we see is that, okay, we have a certain number of elements uh, that are non-zero in this matrix, yes? Yeah? So now we have this S of C, which is some matrix, and whenever we pick an element from this set here, so let, let's take one here, it's row i, and we have a row j up there, then the corresponding element here is going to be a non-zero element, if we pick an element from this set just meaning that they add up to m plus 1. Yeah, but that now, if we let this pair, this choice, run through this set, it means that we will get a number of elements that are non-zero. There may be different pairs, maybe. But what else can we say? Well, if we use this property here, if the sum is less than m plus 1, or less than or equal to m, then it's going to be a 0, which really means that in all these positions we get zeros. Yeah, so combining those two properties, that these are non-zero but all these are zero, it's clear we can pick a submatrix of rank exactly the cardinality of this set. But the rank was equal to the Hamming weight. So we in fact get that the Hamming weight is larger than or equal to the, connect, the cardinality of this set. 
Okay, so this computation has shown us now in the end that for some code words we get a bound on the Hamming wave. Yeah, and what code words were they specifically? There were these two here. So there were these two conditions on it. It is a code word from this code, or equivalently from this C omega code, but it was not allowed to be in this generally general smaller code. So we have excluded something. So how can we now get a bound on a minimum distance? Well, then we need to say something about any possible code word from here. But the good thing about this argument is we can iterate it. So we have chosen a particular m here, but we could have chosen a bigger m. Yeah? So now iterating this argument, we can, so to say, fill out this missing part by increasing this m step by step, and then slowly fill out the entire code. And in the end, the only thing that we will miss is the zero word. And that is okay, we don't have to say anything about the Hamming weight of the zero word, it's zero anyway. So the consequence of all this is that the minimum distance of this code there is going to be, yeah, so to say, the minimum of all these partial results that we got. So the consequence that we get, and I will elaborate on that next time, is that the minimum distance yeah, so the minimum distance of this C omega dmp is at least the minimum of all these cardinalities here. Hardly doesn't fit here, so let me write it somewhere else. Yeah, so as I was saying, this minimum distance of uh, C omega dmp has minimum distance at least the minimum over all these cardinalities and m plus i, where i is larger than or equal to 1. That follows from, from this notation <coughs> by iterating it. Now there's one detail that I didn't mention here because, well, I'm looking at ways to write all these m plus i's as sum of two elements from the semigroup. But what if this m plus 1 or the m plus i is not even from the semigroup? Then there's no way we can write it as a sum. So that is bad, because then it means that the cardinality of this number is zero, and then we would get this minimum zero. So we would get a trivial bound immediately. <coughs> but fortunately, we can check that if m plus 1 is not an element from the semigroup, it's exactly the case where these two codes are the same as well. So then I'm actually looking at the empty set of code words. So luckily, I can exclude those immediately, and I can here add the condition that m plus i actually has to be an element from the semigroup. And now I get a non-trivial bound, and I will show next time this one is at least as good as the one we got using Riemann-Roch. Okay, thank you.